Salaam Kareem, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome to tonight's edition of the Daily Debate here on Now TV International. I'm Nancy Sarah Barakat and tonight we're looking at efforts to revive the peace process between the Palestinians and the Israelis. These efforts are being spearheaded by France, which sent its foreign minister, Laurent Fabios, to the region. Yesterday, Fabios arrived in Cairo and discussed with President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi the possible reawakening of Palestinian-Israeli peace talks and urged the resumption of Middle East peace talks while warning that continued Israeli settlement building in the occupied West Bank had damaged chances of a final deal. Peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians have been in a comatose since a major U.S. push for a final deal ended in failure back in April of 2014. The Palestinians blame the collapse of Israel's settlement building and the government's refusal to release veteran prisoners, while Israel says the process has failed because the Palestinians refused to accept a U.S. framework document outlining the way forward. During the meeting with his Egyptian counterpart, Foreign Minister Sam Shukri expressed his concern over the peace process, saying it requires more international coordination and cooperation. Shukri, who appeared in a press conference with Fabio, said the Arab Peace Initiative is still regionally supported. Fabio also headed on to Amman for discussions with Jordanian King Abdullah II before flying on to Ramallah to meet Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. And his final leg of the two-day trip took him also to see Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem. Are there real prospects for peace? What will it take for both sides to come and sit down on a negotiating table? And what will it take for them to agree on a peace deal? That's what we're going to be discussing later on in the program. But as usual, we've got a couple of top stories making headlines here in Egypt. And let's start off with Yemen, where peace talks between warring factions have failed to produce a ceasefire agreement. The country's exiled foreign minister, Riyad Yassin, blamed the failure of talks in Geneva on the rebel Houthi side, which he said had stalled the peace process. Yassin said that efforts would continue to find a solution to the conflict, but added that no date had been set for a second round of talks. On Thursday, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi met with Yemen's Vice President Khalid Baha'i in Cairo for talks on the latest developments in the crisis-hit country. Baha'i's talks with the President discussed the Egyptian role in the Saudi-led coalition against the Houthi militia. The following report has more details. Talks on the Yemeni crisis ended without agreement on a ceasefire on Friday, but the United Nations special envoy who presided over the process said the door was open for more dialogue and he was still hopeful of a truce. Ismail Will Sheikh Ahmed, UN special envoy for Yemen, said after five days of talks in Geneva that the two sides agreed in principle about the need for a ceasefire and withdrawal of forces in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2216. He said there is a certain willingness from all parties to discuss issues around the ceasefire accompanied by withdrawal as part of the implementation of the resolution. He added that they managed to get suggestions from both sides that they can build upon in coming days in order to reach a permanent agreement. But Ahmed underscored that a ceasefire in Yemen should come before any new round of talks. Ahmed added he would leave Geneva for New York on Sunday to brief the UN Security Council where major powers also need to agree to his plan plans for a force of civilian observers to monitor a truce withdrawal on the ground in Yemen. For his part, UN spokesman said that there has been no date set for a second round of talks, but that discussions can still happen without people meeting in Geneva. Yemen has been worked by conflict between Houthi rebels and troops loyal to exiled President Abdirabbo Mansour Hadi. Last Thursday, President Al-Fatih sisi met with Yemeni Vice President Khalid Baha in Cairo for talks on the latest developments in crisis hit Yemen. The talks also tackled mutual ties between Egypt and Yemen. Yemen as well as means of providing residence for Yemenis in Egypt, following an Egyptian decision to impose entry visas on Yemenis. For his part, Mahfouz stressed on the Yemen's keenness on the Egyptian pivotal role in the Arab region, adding that Egypt occupy distinct status to Yemen. During his four-day visit, the top Yemeni official also held talks with Prime Minister Ibrahim Mahlam and Arab League Secretary General Nabil al -Arabi.
And for more on the issue, I'm being joined now over the phone by Ambassador Hussein Haridi, former Assistant Foreign Minister. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, let me start off by asking you, obviously the peace talks between uh, the warring sides in Yemen has failed, but what next? What should we, and should we expect more talks perhaps in the future as well? Well, from that part, the United Nations, uh, the uh, uh, would be con uh, continued uh, sometime in, in, in the future that you haven't admitted uh, a failure in, in the talks. But they expressed their regret that uh, the warring parties uh, that met in Geneva couldn't agree on a ceasefire during the months of uh, Ramadan. So my impression is that the uh, special UN envoy uh, would uh, try to convene another uh, round of consultation uh, among the Yemeni warring parties sometimes after uh, Ramadan is over. Right. And of course, uh, the, the United Nations uh, would be in uh, trying uh, to help uh, the uh, various Yemeni political parties and political forces to come to the negotiating table and uh, carry out uh, Security Council Resolution 22116. Uh, and I guess that the major Arab powers have agreed that there is no way to settle the Yemeni crisis but to find a political solution that would uh, enlist the support of all the political part parties and forces on the ground in Yemen. Realistically yeah. speaking, Mr. Ambassador, what would it take for the peace talks to actually um, be a success? Well, that all the... Uh, all the, the the warring parties would uh, announce that they will abide uh, with the uh, Gulf initiative, with the uh, implement, implementation mechanism of the uh, Gulf initiative and Security Council Resolution 22116. And if every, every political force, including the Houthis in Yemen, would abide by the the main uh, documents, I, I'm sure that, uh, that the political solution could be found. On Thursday, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi met with the Vice President and Prime Minister of the Yemeni Republic. Do you think the legitimate Yemeni government is looking for Egypt to play a, a bigger role in the, in the conflict? Well, de definitely uh, in the context of the uh, historic Yemeni-Egyptian relations, uh, most uh, Yemeni political forces would welcome any, uh, any uh, uh, Egyptian uh, effort to help them find this political solution. But, but, but from an Egyptian point of view, uh, we support the Gulf Initiative uh, and the Security Council of 2216, and we support every international, or regional, or Arab effort that uh, aims at helping the Yemenis reach uh, a, a political uh, solution to the crisis. We, Egypt has always uh, said and insisted that there is no way for any one Yemeni uh, party mm -hmm. or one Yemeni force to impose its will by the use of force on other Yemeni forces. And I guess President Sisi on, 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 on various occasions have called on all Yemenis to, to come together and agree on a way out of this crisis. Okay, I thank you very much, Ambassador Hussein Haridi, former Assistant Foreign Minister, for your time and for your insights. Now, another top story making headlines was President Abdel Fattah Sisi's meeting today with the Minister of Electricity and Renewable Energy, Mohammed Shakir. Presidential spokesman Ali Youssef said the President was briefed on the rate of electricity production in the past days. The Minister of Electricity told President Sisi that the rate had reached 28,600 megawatts during rush hour on Saturday, while the consumption had reached 25,700 megawatts, meaning that there was a surplus of 2,900 megawatts. Sheikh had also said that the rate which was achieved yesterday is the highest in the ministry's history.
And also our final top story takes us to a headline story that's making news around the world and that's Al Jazeera journalist Mohammed Mansour who was arrested at a Berlin airport on Saturday at the request of Egypt. A spokesman for the German Federal Police confirmed that the 52-year-old Ahmed Mansour was arrested at Berlin's Tegel Airport at 1320 GMT following an international arrest warrant from the Egyptian authorities. The spokesman said the general public prosecutor was now checking the man's identity as well as a possible extradition to Egypt. Cairo's criminal court sentenced Mansour, who has dual Egyptian and British citizenship, to 15 years in absentia last year on charges of torturing a lawyer in Tahrir Square back in 2011. Now to tell us more on this is Dr. Hassan Shaban, Vice President of the al Waft Party. Thank you very much for your time, Doctor. Thank you for calling me. Uh, let me start off by asking, obviously, your thoughts upon hearing the news of Ahmed Mansour's arrest. Well, I think uh, what happened, uh, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, German Interpol arrested uh, Ahmed Mansour uh, due to a uh, request from the Egyptian Interpol. And, uh, I, you know, my impression that Ahmed Mansour will use his British citizenship and British passport to get away with that because, uh, 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 you know, we are under a lot of pressure from the German, from the German side, and, uh, concerns our, uh, you know, uh, uh, trials uh, yeah. against the, uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and I do not think uh, that they will give Ahmad Mansour to Egypt. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I don't think also it is wise uh, from our side uh, to repeat again uh, the trial of the, uh, the Al Jazeera uh, Marriott uh, group. You know, we had a lot of headache out of that. I think uh, Ahmed Mansour realizes now that he is wanted in Egypt, and I think he might give up his uh, Egyptian citizenship uh, and, uh, you know, forget about it and uh, um, but dr. Hassan you mentioned something very important and that is the uh, recurrence of if you will the uh, previous court case against uh, the Al Jazeera reporters but this is very different this is a man who is wanted on crimes has been given passed out a 50 year for actually torturing uh, a lawyer in Tahrir Square so these are very different charges uh, yes I understand uh, you're very you're very right about that but right. again uh, you know, there was no uh, cross-examining with uh, Ahmed Mansour. It is just uh, an, an acquisition from a lawyer against Ahmed Mansour. I do not think that uh, there is a, a concrete case against Ahmed Mansour. And I, I have a feeling that the Germans are about to release him, actually. Right. But to what extent, I mean, is it perhaps a step in the right direction by perhaps European countries, and especially German authorities, given their, um, if you will, reservations about what's happening in Egypt or what has happened after the June 30th revolution? To what extent is that also a step in the right direction towards um, perhaps highlighting or clarifying what's happening on the ground here in Egypt? Actually, uh, you know, uh, we cannot stop others from stating their opinion about what's happening it's you know they have completely a, 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 a very a, you know different set of rules right. in Europe and in the States everybody is entitled to state his opinion uh, we have the right to uh, to put justice uh, you know in the right uh, manner and uh, I think uh, I don't think that the timing is in our favor, uh, you know, to bring up the Ahmad Mansour issue right now. Okay. Uh, well, I think, you know, I think we ought to cool it off and uh, close this file for the time being. This is my personal opinion. Uh, we have enough in, in our plate to worry about. Hmm. So, uh, 
Let's not increase our headaches. Well, thank you very much for your opinion. We don't really need to. Thank, Thank you very much for your insights and your opinion, Engineer Hassan Shaban, Vice President of Al Waft Party. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start our main discussion for the evening, let's take a look at the following report highlighting French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius's visit to Cairo, during which he met with President Abdel Fattah el Sisi and Foreign Minister Saleh Shukri. Let's take a look. President Fatih Sisi and French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius agreed on the importance of cooperation in the face of challenges that jeopardize not only regional security but that of Europe as well. They agreed to work for the best interests of both their peoples. Asked about the Egyptian ceasefire initiative, Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri said that 15 members of the UN Security Council as well as a number of international parties gave it the OK. The conflicting parties also agreed to the initiative which, according to Shokri, offers a chance for ceasefire, lifting the siege imposed on Gaza. Shokri also said that President Sisi and Fabius agreed on the importance of cooperation in the faces of challenges that jeopardize not only regional security but that of Europe as well. For his part, the French Foreign Minister said that Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas asked France to use its influence on Hamas allies to help negotiate a ceasefire between the Gaza Group and Israel. Fabius said that the ceasefire is an urgent imperative, but it must guarantee a lasting truce, adding that it must also take account of Israel's security and Palestinian demands. Fabius added that the French officials are in contact with all those who can influence the process, including the two countries' governments. He also said that the European Union could set observer missions at border crossings between the Gaza Strip and Israel to try to encourage a lasting truce between the two sides. The French foreign minister also visits Palestine and Israel to express his country's desire to restart negotiations between the two sides. In December, peace talks fell through when the U.S. voted against the Palestinian drafted resolution calling for an Israeli withdrawal from the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem, the establishment of a Palestinian state by late 2017. A new Suez Canal. A national project. Fully financed and implemented by the Egyptians. لازم هنتحرك ونتحرك بقوة عشان نخرج من من دائرة الفقر اللي احنا موجودين فيها احنا بنسابق الزمن احنا عايزين نبني بلدنا عايزين نبقى في امل حقيقي مش هنبيع وهم للناس لان احنا متأخرين قوي طب والله العظيم احنا مستعدين نبيع نفسينا عشان خطر مصر التخطيط اللي كان معمول قبل كده كان بيتصور ان احنا ممكن نتكلم على حاجة على امتداد القناة بالكامل واحنا كان لينا في الدفاع وقتها انا بقول وانا كنت مسؤول عن ده وقلت ان ده هيبقى ضد الامن القوم المصري في المشروعات اللي هي خاصة بالقناة وحفر القناة وملكية القناة دي للمصري زي دلوقتي لو كان لي عمر انا وان شاء الله المصريين لهم العمر نيجي ونفتتح المرحله ديت ونعبر في القناه الجديده ال 35 كيلو
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And joining me here in the studio is Dr. Ahmed Mehenna, Professor of Political Science. Thank you very much for coming Thank in tonight. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Let me start off by asking you, obviously, uh, of your overall impressions of uh, the French initiative to restart the peace process. Um, I think the French initiative uh, is really starting after the failure to uh, um, accept the resolution that was submitted by the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, in the Security Council in December 2014, where they obtained only four votes uh, out of the nine votes they really required to adopt. And we've seen one of the countries that really uh, opposed the resolution was United States. Um, basically, the resolution included that uh, Palestine can control or Israel to withdraw from the West Bank uh, and also can be used, uh, Jerusalem to be used as a capital for the two-state uh, solution uh, on top of that to stop all forms of violence. So um, let's look at France in, in general. France, first of all, is, is a good friend of Israel and I think mm. it's also a good friend of the Palestinians. They were one of the first countries that uh, accept relationship or accept the state of Israel and uh, uh, basically enforcing the fact that the Jewish people uh, have the right to live. That's the, the approach that was right. implemented after 1947. So they established uh, a good relationship with the Israelis. Uh, along these years, they also participated uh, in all peace negotiations. Um, uh, they have a strong role in the European uh, Union as well as the international community. They have a, a great role in the Security Council. And here they're starting to revive the uh, peace talks because they basically believe and according to the statement of Mr. Fabius, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, that the frozen peace talks will lead to uh, violence and it will never stop. So he's coming to the Middle East. Uh, he already met with uh, President Sisi and in his plan uh, basically to meet the Mr. Netanyahu as well as the Mr. Abbas. Right. So the fact here that they're trying to uh, revive the peace talks uh, to reach a solution and France since 1947 believe in a two-state two uh, solution mm. and they condemn all sorts of violence and condemn all sorts of settlement as well uh, and, and we've seen that the Israeli uh, uh, government mm. uh, summoned uh, the government of France after supporting the resolution of Palestine in December 2014. Well, perhaps the, there is uh, one asks, wonders why now and is there a significance to the timing? I mean and the significance to France being the one country that is looking at the Palestinian situation and saying no we need a two-state solution now. I think the uh, after the Arab Spring or the Arab Autumn as some people uh, uh, it's not really my, my, my topic but the fact here is the the international community whether it's France, United States, Germany or England they play different roles so we've seen when the United States object France comes forward uh, and, and here they're playing a different role uh, to basically in the Western benefits in the warm waters of the Middle East look in particularly at the energy um, sector. So the Arabs, uh, and we always need to stress that the Arabs control more than 40% of natural resources. So France is coming forward definitely for their benefit. Mm. I don't think they really uh, believe uh, in, in having uh, uh, the situation or the peace talks to go forward uh, because we've seen that in the past 60 years and more. Uh, nothing is really happening. Uh, why now? I think uh, now with the establishment of the Arab Joint um, Army, the, uh, the process, uh, we are in the beginning of, uh, of reforming the Arab League and I think this is going to change the entire uh, uh, world order in, in the next few years, um, how the 23 countries are formed in terms of the relationship um, and we probably look in, in, in the next few uh, mm. uh, years at reforming the constitution of the Arab League to allow more power into the Arab League to resolve all its issues. And I think once the Arabs have the power, they are able to, to resolve the situation mm -hmm. in I'd Palestine. I'd like to expand on that, but just after we take uh, this phone call, and we have uh, with us uh, Ambassador Hazem Abu Shanab, member of the Fatah Party's Revolutionary Council. <coughs> Thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. Thank you so much, and uh, happy Ramadan, inshallah. Thank you. Same to you. Uh, Ambassador Hazan, let me start off by asking you, obviously, your impressions of the initiative uh, by France and also um, the meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas today. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The, the, uh, the, the French initiative is, uh, has been declared by the uh, Palestinian Authority that it is accepted. Uh, the conditions that are uh, mentioned uh, in, uh, in such uh, initiative uh, is accepted and it's close to be um, 
يعني as a as a kind of solution between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It can be a start for negotiations uh, talks again, mm. uh, especially that we are talking about a time limit for the uh, for negotiating and for having results of such peace process. So uh, we can say that it's accepted. The uh, uh, the French uh, 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 foreign minister looked so much that he is in between the two parties and he can he can practice some pressure over the Israelis. Although me myself, I don't think that no one can practice pressure against this fundamentalist uh, government of the Israeli uh, uh, government. Um, led by Benjamin Netanyahu and his uh, fundamentalist members, which are uh, members of his government. Right, um, but, but let me ask you, given the current status quo, I mean, how feasible is it that the Palestinians and the Israelis come down and speak together uh, on one table? Um, we always say that we are ready. No problem in that. We are ready to sit on a table. We are ready to start negotiating again with the Israelis. But we are not ready to lose more time than the, the time that we lost during only negotiating. The Israelis did uh, change the whole theme uh, and the concept of the peace process by going for talking and talking and talking and talking. Right. They exerted too much effort to not to exert any effort towards peace. So that's what the Israelis did do all over uh, the, the 22 uh, years uh, in the past, uh, for the past period. I believe that Benjamin Netanyahu and his government, they are not representing uh, uh, an acceptance for the peace process and to pay the price for any peace to be established in the Middle East. I believe that this uh, government by the Israelis is not ready to go for any kind of uh, peaceful solution with the Palestinians. He declared... Benjamin Netanyahu, I mean, he declared loudly that he is not accepting the idea of establishing a Palestinian state, a peace process depending on a solution of two states over one land, which is the land of historic Palestine. So, um, I mean, let's watch what will happen. The Palestinians are ready. We can go for such uh, negotiations if we have the limits of the time and the results. The results must be accepted by the two parties and to be... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the main uh, uh, the main topics that can be discussed over the table with in, 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 with the French intervene. Ambassador Hazan, we know that the Palestinian Authority will submit later on this week its first file to the International Criminal Court in a bid to open uh, right. criminal proceedings against Israel. Now, yes. this is an important move on the one hand, but it also could hurt any prospects for Israel to be willing to talk to the Palestinian Authority, don't you think? No, 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 no. I don't, uh, I don't think so, and I believe that this is a track and the other one is a, is a track. Right. Um, during what we are doing, uh, Yanni, let's go for the, a little bit for the um, close, uh, uh, close path. We also, that even during the peace process was running on the table, uh, all of that, the Israeli uh, uh, airstrikes did, uh, yeah, did smash everything all over the Palestinian heads. I'm talking about the Gaza Strip, I'm talking about the West Bank. Every, everything was demolished by the Israeli army, occupational army, uh, in the last uh, 15 years. So the Israelis are not, uh, did say that they are uh, differentiating between the the, the, the two actions that they are practicing at the same time, I mean, talking on the peace process between brackets and going for uh, demolishing uh, and sweeping, in fact, mm. the whole establishments of the Palestinian Authority. So we can say that the uh, going for the international, for the ICC, is something very important for the Palestinians to have, to build something like a wall to relay right. on. I'm talking about something... Uh, uh, meaning that we can depend on the international law, we can depend on the international community, we can depend on the ICC to stop any any kind of uh, Israeli aggression against the Palestinians. We also, we all saw, Miss Nancy, that the Palestinians were killed severely in a, in a way that no one did imagine before. We saw it on TV live, while they were um, striking the Gaza Strip, the buildings, the, the towers, everything they did uh, strike for the civilians and they killed more than uh, almost uh, 2,900 Palestinians. So, and, and, and they caused also uh, the collapse of more than 12,000 houses of the Palestinians. We are talking about 
severe injuries also among the Palestinians. I'm so we are going to the ICC. Right. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have you with us over the phone to ask you about uh, a piece of news that I read uh, in preparation for today's interview, and that is that Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas announced that the national unity government he had formed with Hamas last year will dissolve. Is there any truth to that? Uh, we are going for, uh, for a new government of the Palestinian Authority, and it will be also a unity government. Um, Hamas didn't accept the idea of going for such a government. Uh, the whole, the old, the old uh, let's, let's make it like that. All the Palestinian fragments, all the Palestinian parties are joining the next government, except Hamas, which is not accepting. Hamas wants something that is uh, under their to, to rely on or to depend on. They want a government that's working by themselves only. We are not accepting that. And you know personally, and I'm again and again and again, I will keep saying that Hamas is not representing the Palestinian people, and Hamas is only a little fragment among the Palestinian people, like any other people all over the world. We have one party, two parties, or even tens of parties. Hamas is only just like them. But doesn't this make the peace process or negotiations, if you will, more difficult? Because, again, Israel has used this uh, before against, uh, if you will, sitting down on the table. They say, well, you know, we don't know who to speak to because we want to do something about the situation in Gaza, but we don't know if we should be speaking to the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. The fact that we are now moving away from Hamas or or if you will, uh, saying that it isn't part of the new government, could that also be used uh, against the peace process by the Israelis? I hope that you can, you can see the smile over my face while uh, such uh, claims of the Israelis are, 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 are said. Um, no, it's uh, completely no. Uh, Hamas is not representing the Palestinian people, and uh, we only have one chair for the representatives of the Palestinian people, which is the PLO, which mm. is recognized also by the international community in the UN, in the Arab League, in the um, um, Muslim uh, organizations. All the organ international organizations are uh, uh, recognizing the PLO, which is representing the whole Palestinian. Uh, Hamas is not a, a member of that. Yes, we agree. But Hamas is not representing the Palestinian people. And um, the Israelis are only doing, as I said before, uh, that they are exerting too much effort to not to exert any effort for the peace process. This is number one. I heard your uh, lovely guest, uh, I, uh, I heard a few words by himself. Uh, he was uh, talking about uh, uh, forming um, uh, uh, like an Arab army right, or right. an Arab force can, can work in the, in, the, in the future, the very near future. I believe that uh, such kind of... Uh, Arab force, which is, I don't believe that they will act against the, uh, the Israeli occupation, but I believe that they will act against the fundamentalism in the region. So I believe the fundamentalism regarding the concept of this uh, new force will deal with, with, with any kind of um, uh, local uh, fragments or local organizations, fundamentalist uh, um, uh, organizations mm -hmm. working or um, activ activating themselves in the Arab League region. So uh, such groups that you mentioned, uh, whatever they, their names, I believe that they will, uh, they, they will vanish in the next future, next close uh, future, and I believe Hamas would be one of them. I'm talking about the, uh, the armed uh, arm right. of, uh, of such, uh, like the Muslim Brotherhood, and they consider themselves as, um, as an arm of the right. Muslim Brotherhood. I thank you very much for your time and for your insights, Dr. and Ambassador Hazem Abu Shalab, member of the Fatah Party's Revolutionary Council. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before I continue my discussion with Mr. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed Mohenna, let's take a look at another report that we have for you. And the Palestinian Authority will be submitting, as I said earlier, its first file to the International Criminal Court in a bid to open criminal proceedings against Israel. Let's take a look at that. A Palestinian official said that the Palestinians will next week submit their first file to the International Criminal Court in their bid to open criminal proceedings against Israel. The move is part of an increased focus on diplomatic maneuvering and appeals to international bodies by the Palestinians who have been frustrated by a lack of progress in ending the Israeli occupation and creating their own independent state. 
Palestinian Foreign Ministry official Ammar Hagazi said that the file is to be handed to the ICC Chief Prosecutor Fatou bin Soda on the 25th of June and will detail alleged violations of international law by Israel. On the 1st of April, the Palestinians formally joined the ICC with the goal of trying Israeli leaders for alleged abuses during last summer's Israeli offensive on Gaza Strip and alleged crimes relating to the occupation of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Gazi said that the file is certainly draws a grim picture of what Israel is doing and why they think there are reasonable grounds for the prosecutors to start investigations. He said that it does not refer to specific incidents, but the Palestinians will submit such details in future if Ben Soda decides to proceed with inquiries. Ben Soda's office has opened a preliminary examination into Palestinian claims starting from June 2014. Earlier this year, as the Palestinians were putting their accession to the ICC in motion, President Mahmoud Abbas sent documents to the court authorizing the prosecutor to investigate alleged crimes that took place in Palestinian territories since June 13, 2014. The Israeli assault last summer killed about 2,200 Palestinians and 73 on the Israeli side. Among the tragic events of Israel's offensive on Gaza was Israel's bombing of UN schools being used as shelters for the displaced. Israel claimed it was forced to carry out the strikes because Hamas used them to store weapons or fire rockets at Israel. The ICC set up in 2002 is the world's only permanent independent body to try the most serious crimes of concern to the international community. Welcome back. Dr. Ahmed, let me come back to an important point that you made earlier, and that is the existence uh, or, or the starting up, if you will, of the Arab force. Now, yes. how would an Arab force be able to aid or perhaps uh, to somehow intervene? Or, or resolve, resolve the, the whole all, case. Yes. Um, first of all, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the uh, talks of uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we hoped that he would have been with, with us tonight. Um, I disagree with him that Hamas will affect the, uh, the negotiations, first of all, because he, he does think that Hamas doesn't represent anything. But I do think that it does represent because it controls the, the Gaza Strip. Right. So it's basically kind of a federation uh, or a federal uh, rule. Um, it, it wouldn't have been uh, easier if they were part of the same land that's controlled by Fatah, but at this point in time, uh, Fatah controls sector of the land and they control the Gaza Strip, so definitely they do affect. And I agree with you that definitely Israel uses that as a kind of mm. uh, excuse. When it comes to the Arab League, I think the, since 1947, the weakness of the Arab has always been the fact that that encourages Israel to violate all uh, uh, rules and regulations when it comes to um, human rights, international uh, law. We've seen that from uh, the war in 1947. We've seen that from the protectionism that was uh, enforced by the British uh, um, Empire over Palestine and Egypt and then giving the land away uh, to the Israelis established in, 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 uh, in 48, uh, realizing the Arabs suddenly that the land was sold by the British to the Jews. The fact here is the reform of the Arab League, because if you look at the Constitution, and, and what I'm going to say is definitely going to be strange to a lot of people, the Constitution of the Arab League was initially proposed by the British Empire right. trying to keep the Arabs busy, so they proposed the establishment of the Arab League. Now, that constitution needs to be reformed because the actual voting within the Arab League doesn't uh, help resolving the actual issues. And we've seen that even in the Gulf War in 1990. We've seen that in 2013 and 14 with Libya and Syria. All they, they, they do is condemn and reject, but the actual fact in terms of an active role, uh, this is not happening. The reform of the Arab League having a, a, a united uh, or a form of a united um, army with the Arabs, I think it's going to enforce the power of the Arabs uh, from the Gulf to uh, the Atlantic, and this is what we need. We don't really need an army to attack Israel. That's not right. what we need. What we need is a power that sits around the table to negotiate uh, from uh, a powerful position to say this issue has to be resolved. We're talking about uh, an, an, a conflict that is running for 65 years. Nobody is actually uh, uh, you know, uh, helping in an active role, and we've seen now from what the ambassador said, he's actually not optimistic about the talk. 
Stokes is saying that the uh, Netanyahu is actually playing on more time. So the fact here is that we know what they're doing, yet we walk into negotiation and we but know it's not going to work. Why does that continue to happen? I mean, what, obviously it seems like because we're going we're round in circles. Because we're weak. Right. We, we negotiate from a weakness position. So the fact here is I'm negotiating with a powerful person, so whatever he gives me, I'm going to accept. And what, whenever he asks, asks me to sit around the table to negotiate, I walk and run through, uh, I run to him. And whenever he, he stops, uh, I stop. So the fact here, we're running in circle, I agree with you 100%, because we're weak. We don't have the power. Israelis don't really realize the power, the power of the Arab to resolve the issue, and therefore they're playing on time. Uh, on, on time uh, uh, always and we've seen that from the settlement they negotiate mm -hmm. with the Palestinians at the same time they're running settlements and we've seen uh, lately I think 180 uh, uh, units have been built so right. the fact here is this issue has to come to an end and it's not going to come to an end without a reform of the Arab without a reform of the, the international Arab community has obviously expressed its dismay with Israel for continuing its settlement building yeah. which it has which the international community has largely denounced yeah. And yet continues, and yet Israel continues to defy Absolutely, the international because nothing's community. Gonna happen. The international community is not going to get involved because the fact here is, international community gets involved in Iraq and destroyed it um, fully, um, claiming that uh, there is no democracy. Uh, destroyed Libya, claiming that uh, there is a tyrant called mm. uh, Gaddafi. But why are they not getting involved in Palestine? Because here they announced in 1947 that the Jewish people have the right to live. Right. Now, have the right to live, we accept as Arabs. Uh, that they have the right to live, but not during, to this, uh, during this approach or not according to this approach. So they basically enforcing a two-state solution. And my vision is, or my, what I see, that a two-state solution will happen, but will happen when, on the minimum benefit of the Arabs. Right. So at this point in time, we continue to lose, as Mr. Ambassador said, we continue to lose. And the fact here, we're not going to win anything unless they actually give it to us. And it's going to continue like that. An interesting point, perhaps, that the French Foreign Minister brought up during his talk is that he said that if the conflict remains unresolved, radical groups such as Daesh will make the Palestinian cause their own. Exactly. This is exactly they, they creating the problem and throwing it to us. Who created Daesh? It's the West. Hmm. Daesh was created by the West. Where did they get the weapons? from the Western community. So the fact here is they created uh, uh, the genie, if you like, and then throw it to us and saying, well, it's your problem, you solve it. You either kill these people, Daesh groups, or they're going to affect your negotiations. So the fact is they created them. Now it becomes our problem to fight with them, creating a civil war amongst us, Shias with Sunnis and Muslims and Christians, and become in, in the entire Middle East fighting amongst each other, and Israel uh, uh, publicly waiting for us to finish uh, all these civil wars and then they're going to sit with us and negotiate. And when is this going to finish? Once we finish something, comes, something else comes mm. up. We already had terrorist groups in the 90s and the 2000s. Now we've got Daesh in different groups. We've got the Muslim Brotherhoods in different areas. So the conflict continues to be created for the Arabs to keep them busy. And the problem is we keep swallowing the bait. And we know that it's actually a bait, yet we still run after a solution. No solution is going to happen without the power uh, of Palestinian authority, Palestinian nation surrounded by the Arabs uh, as a nation, 23 countries, to stand and say to the international community, we're going to have to find a solution to this. Does going to the International Criminal Court filing, uh, if you will, filing lawsuits against uh, Israel, go, give it or give the Palestinian Authority more strength, do you think? If we go back to 1967 and 68, there's already the two resolution, 242, is already saying that the uh, Israelis should withdraw from the land occupied from 1967. So I actually don't need more documents to strengthen my position. I, I definitely agree with you that it, it you know, to, to some people it might, you know, create uh, certain evidence against the acts of Israel mm. in, in Palestine. But the fact here is, uh, already the international community already accepted the fact that I own the land. So having to declare certain crimes uh, uh, acted uh, by the Israeli government on this particular land doesn't change anything. It mm. still make them occupiers because they already accepted the fact that I own the land. So we need to always go back to the actual issue. Solving a problem always has uh, to come from the root. They actually 
uh, distracting our attention by sending crim crimes here and talking about settlements and talking about uh, you know the the um, the entries and exit of the Palestinians mm. and the human rights violation. These are all lovely issues, but the fact here, if we go back to the actual root of the problem, the actual root of the problem is I owe the land. Finished. Right. Whatever happens on it, it's not going to change the fact, and it's not going to make me stronger. Right. Uh, that's basically what I mean. So we need to. As but, 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 nevertheless, but nevertheless, the fact that the Palestinians did go to the International Criminal Court and did become members of the court it did, it did bother Israel. It did, definitely, because the, the, the last thing that Israel wants is have a, an image of the Palestinian international community. And they already objected to the uh, Security Council, they objected to the uh, National Assembly of the United Nations. This is all lovely, but it's still going to have the main issue is Palestinians own the land. It's a fact. It goes back to Moses and the immigration of the Jews and the Arabs need to go back to the history to find that this land was occupied immediately after uh, the uh, um, migration from different countries mm. uh, 2,000 years ago. The fact here is we go back to the history we find the root of the problem that this land is an Arab land occupied by the Jewish people, never lived and never had a state in, in that area. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the statements that were made by the Israeli Prime Minister during talks with Laurent Fabius. Now he said that um, there could be no peace without uh, security agreements uh, for Israel. Now those uh, that will enable Israel to defend itself rather, what kind of uh, security guarantees does Israel want? Israel doesn't need any security because they already have the, you know, the dome, they already have missiles, they have the most advanced weapons. So in terms of security, I don't think they need any security measures. In terms of the people around them, uh, in, in the Palestinians or even the Arabs, accepted the fact that there is a state of Israel. Let's, let's be honest. The Arabs uh, led by Egypt accepted the fact that there is a state of Israel. So what security do you want? Mm. Uh, the fact here is we're trying to resolve a two issue. And the Palestinians always sit around the table and say, we accept the two-state solution. We will provide you with whatever guarantees they want. And this has already been said uh, since Yasser Arafat. So there isn't really any change. It's always statements that uh, uh, makes them in a situation where they are vulnerable, they are scared of uh, any uh, violation from the Arab side, but the fact that the Arabs don't have the power to actually violate. Mm -hmm. um, Israelis, we're talking about over a million um, uh, Palestinians in Gaza, they, they have no water, no electricity, no sewage, uh, uh, so the fact here is it is in a difficult, they are in a difficult situation. They don't have any measures to attack them. So the fact here is, sit around the table, put a proposal, the international community will endorse it. Uh, so the fact here is, there's nothing that Israel needs to be worried about because we are a weak nation and the fact that we don't have the power to attack them. So this is just a statement to distract people from the main thing. I always throw the ball back to the Arabs that we are willing hmm. to get into the uh, negotiations, but we just worried that you will violate. What kind of violation have you seen from 1947? Right. Nothing. Uh, the, the 1948 war uh, was already violated by their own uh, corrupted Arabs mm. and, and led to the, the defeat of Egypt in 1948 and since that time you've already been ruling and you're already in control. The leadership that we're enforced by the, uh, in the Arab um, community has get, have guaranteed you uh, by these weak leaders, by the leaders that were bought by the Western society, guaranteed you uh, all peace and we've seen negotiations, we've seen businesses, we've seen investments inside Israel from the Arab leaders. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Thank Ahmed you. and Mahana, Professor of Political Science. Hopefully we'll be back uh, once again and we will be able to meet once again sure. once some uh, process uh, has been made. Thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap to tonight's edition of the Daily Debate. We'll be coming again your way tomorrow. Time has changed during the holy month of Ramadan. We start at uh, 10 p.m. Cairo local time instead of 9 o'clock. And then we'll be back again tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you very much for watching.